get started. A few people are still coming into the waiting room, but uh, we'll admit them as they come. I want to welcome everybody. Uh, the idea of focusing on humor for one of our readings came from my co-founder, Catherine Seitz, where a lot of great ideas come from. And as many of you know, the Poets Corner was founded by myself and Catherine to create and expand community among writers and readers of poetry and short prose. We began in June of 2020, right in the middle of that lockdown and beginning of the pandemic. And here we are two years later. And I'm so grateful that all of you have been wonderful participants and supporters of the Poets Corner. So we planned this program wordplay to bring a much needed smile into our lives and yours. And two years into the pandemic with inflation, with the climate crisis, and even more now with that unthinkable war in Ukraine. So thinking we needed this desperately, I reached out to one of my favorite po poets who's Wit and wordplay always bring a smile to my face on important subjects. And um, I just get delight from reading the poetry of Kevin Pilkington. So thank you, Kevin, for joining us today. Uh, he's the author of nine collections of poetry and two novels. His newest novel, it's called Taking on Secrets, and it will be released later this year. And we're also very grateful that Kevin's a member of the Poets' Corner Advisory Board. He'll be reading some of his poems in our program today. Yeah. And next, I reached out to David Jewell, who is a poet from Austin, Texas, whose poems at times have had me laughing out loud. Uh, David is a performance poet, a visual and multimedia artist who I first met when he took a workshop at Maine Media Workshops. And on Friday nights at the end of the workshops, everybody did a reading. And David read a poem, which I'm hoping that he's going to read today, that just had me laughing so much that I had to ask him for a copy of the poem and go home immediately and read it to my husband. So I'm thrilled that David agreed to co-host this event with me today. So we'll be reading a few of our own poems and then selections from other poets that make us smile or whose humor we appreciate. Um, as always, we'll be recording this event so if you don't want to appear in the video, just feel free to turn your camera off. And I'd like to tell you about two upcoming events in April. First, on April 10th, John Paul Caponegro will co-host with me a program that we're calling Eco Poetry Voices for Our Future. We'll have several outstanding Maine poets reading their poems and others related to this theme of man, nature, the environment and our impact on our futures. Joining us will be Gary Lawless, Kathleen Ellis, Iris LaCates and Megan Sterling, poets of various ages and sensibilities that will bring interesting perspectives to this subject. And on April 20th, we're collaborating with Mercy by the Sea, a retreat center in Connecticut to bring Naomi Shehap Nye for a Zoom event entitled Everything Comes Next and How Does Poetry Help Us? There will be more coming on our website very shortly about this special event in honor of National Poetry Month. There will be a fee to attend. Um, so you'll get more information about that later on. And I wanna say thank you to all the people who submitted 
to the Poets Corner first ever chapbook contest that we've done in collaboration with Maine Media Workshops in college. We were just overwhelmed by such a tremendous response. We got 259 entries into our chapbook contest and we're reading through them now. And I wanna say a very special thank you to our readers, many of whom I think are on today and you know who you are and you took on more than you expected to take on in that. But the contest will be judged. Uh, the final finalists will be chosen by Naomi Shehab Nye. And that will happen in April sometime. So thank you to all of you who have submitted and who have supported this. So before we begin with our humor, I want to take a serious moment uh, to honor the people of Ukraine who are fighting for their homeland. And I want to read a poem by Serhi Zaydin, who is a literary superstar in Ukraine. And he has had thousands of people that come to his readings. Uh, there is really a wonderful literary tradition in Ukraine, and I'm just learning about this poet. So I want to read his poem, which is called So, so I'll Talk About It. And it was translated by John Hennessy and Ostap Kin. So I'll talk about it, about the green eye of a demon in the colorful sky, an eye that watches from the sidelines of a child's sleep, the eye of a misfit whose excitement replaces fear. Everything started with music, with scars left by songs heard at fall weddings with other kids my age, the adults who made music. Adulthood defined by this, the ability to play music, as if some new note responsible for happiness appears in the voice, as if this knack is innate in men to be both hunter and singer. Music is the caramel breath of women, tobacco scented hair of men who gloomily prepare for a knife fight with the demon who has just crashed the wedding. Music beyond the cemetery wall, flowers that grow from women's pockets, school children who peek into the chambers of death. The most beaten paths lead to the cemetery and water. You hide only the most precious things in the soil, the weapon that ripens with wrath, porcelain hearts of parents that will chime like the songs of a school choir. I'll talk about it, about the wind instruments of anxiety, about the wedding ceremony as memorable as entering Jerusalem. Set the broken psalmic rhythm of rain beneath your heart. Men that dance the way they quench step fire with their boots. Women that hold on to their men in dance like they don't want to let them go to war. Eastern Ukraine, the end of the second millennium. The world is brimming with music and fire. In the darkness, flying fish and singing animals give voice. In the meantime, almost everyone who got married then has died. In the meantime, the parents of people my age have died. In the meantime, most heroes have died. The sky unfolds as bitter as it is in Gogol, Gogol's novellas echoing the singing of people who gather the harvest, echoing the music of those who cart stones from the field, echoing, it doesn't stop. Thank you. 
it's it's going to be hard to switch from that to humor. But we all need humor. And we all need that in times that are hard. So I'm going to ask you to make that shift. And I'm going to ask you to do uh, that by starting to put in the chat a movie or a scene from a favorite movie uh, that you found funny, because each of us has a very different sense of humor. So as I ask, uh, as we each read, we're going to talk a little bit about our own senses of humor. And we're going to start with David, David Jewell. And David, if you would get us going, that would be great. All right. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for uh, reading that and acknowledging the Ukraine and reading that poem. I appreciate that very much because um, it is hard to just, okay, let's be funny. Um, but I'm going to try to be here and now. And um, it's kind of interesting that the first, when you asked me to think of funny poems to read, where my mind went first was some really brutally dark poems that uh, I know, like by a poem I, A, I, who's a brilliant writer. And then uh, I even thought of uh, Sylvia Plath, Daddy, you know, like I was interested how my mind went to all these places. And what the connection for me was that when something makes me laugh, it's it's a it's an instant freedom. It's a shock. It's a surprise, and uh, I was thinking, it, you know, it's a visceral thing. It hits you below your head. You know, it hits you it hits you in your heart. And so I think any any use of language that just just changes reality instantly for me. Um, you know, you wouldn't call it funny necessarily. Um, but I was thinking of the word humorous and humors and, you know, all the, it just shakes you up, changes your perspective. And uh, so, you know, some of the comics I like, but like Stephen Wright with his one-liners and, um, you know, it's a small world, but I wouldn't want to have to paint it. Um, I was quoting that forever and I just said, it's a small world, but I wouldn't want to paint it. Then I looked it up and it's a small world, but I wouldn't want to have to paint it. And I found that have to really changes it all. Um, and uh, <clears throat> just, you know, movies like uh, airplane, I have a drinking problem and the guy, you know, really kind of stupid things are funny. Uh, but I, I did, uh, I think I found some, and then generally it's like really subtle things I like. I like Dada a lot. I like uh, kind of just things that don't make sense, but in a, it's hard to define wh why one thing works and why, why one thing doesn't, but. Um, and then there's no such thing as works really, because some things that crack me up, like everybody's just sitting there you know, stone-faced and, and vice versa. Uh, like, yeah, a lot of over-the-top humor, I just, just bores me sometimes. So anyway, without further ado, I, I have a couple to read here. Um, I might, there's the second one I might cheat and because they're two short ones, but anyway. So I'll start with Toaster Bot. Um, I wanted to make toast this morning, but my toaster bot said I had to download Quick Flame or it wouldn't make anything. Barely awake, I tried to download the upgrade, but it said I could not upgrade unless I prepaid Highbrain and then rebooted to synthesize the new Wonderware. Somehow, I managed to do that. I put bread in the toaster, but it said I had to specify 
the kind of bread and exactly how crispy or golden brown or burnt I wanted it to be. I said, I want it double burnt. It said I had to enter my password and debit card number for the double burnt option. It is extra. I knew the to I threw the toaster out the window and ran over it with my car, which my car barely agreed to do, and then drove to the restaurant. I started to order toast and coffee from the speaker screen at my table, but it interrupted me to ask how I was feeling on this scintillatingly beautiful day. I said, I want double burnt cinnamon toast and cinnamon coffee. The speaker screen said if I ordered three eggs, bacon, and biscuits, it would be cheaper. I said, that's okay. I just really want double burnt cinnamon toast and cinnamon coffee. It said if I ordered the pancake belly slammer, it would be cheaper, and asked how I was feeling on this beautifully scintillating day. I ripped the speaker screen off the wall, but my grumpy act was instantly broad posted and down thumbed by a new never sleep table cam. 10 seconds later, the attitude police barged in with their nanobots swarming like metallic fleas. I shut down my neural weave and left quietly. Then I drove to Retro Mart to see if they had a 1965 Toast Master General with plastic push-down handles and deco trim. They did. What a scintillatingly beautiful day. I love that poem, David. <laughs> I think that is great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so <clears throat> I have a couple short ones. In the interest of wordplay, I wanted to do these because the title's wordplay. So these are poems. I can't remember what the originals are or were or even how they happened, but I, I was reading into the text app on my phone. I think something I'd written before from my journal or something. And it kept messing things up. And I found the way it messed things up was far better than what I had originally written. <laughs> so I, I wrote a kind of a series. Um, here's the, the first one. There is a coconut falling on my head, knocks me out a while. I see stars and birds are doing cartoons, but that's okay. At least, you know, she was nearby. At least I'm on the beach, listening to the rain source through the eternal song. And what impressed me about that was, that is totally my phone, the bit about the rain source through the eternal song. That's the ocean, like, wow, I would have never come up with it. Um, and then just for another short one. Uh, vivacious introspection was hounding me on that cold wintry day. I was locked inside and I was locked inside myself. Every time I turned around, the fire started. Every time I turned around, a gun went off. Every time I turned around, my baby wanted to give me a book. <laughs> so that's, that's half written by me and half by my computer. <laughs> that's great. That's great. I love autocorrect sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. As long as I don't send it, it to somebody times. else. <laughs> it has changed my husband's name. It changes... I, I think I wrote a poem about this. It changes Roger's name to River so often that I just started calling him River. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah, I'd go with River. <laughs> it's a cool name, right? It flows. Yeah, it's good. That was great. Thank you, David. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. So I'm going to talk a little bit. I, I, I think, I don't know about my sense of humor. I don't like really physical humor. I don't like slapstick humor. I love wordplay. I love 
the twist of phrase. I love the kind of more introspective, self-deprecating, just playful kind of humor, I think. But anyway, a, a good turn of phrase will really always bring a smile to my lips or something like, you know, your toaster bot poem that just makes fun of the things we do every single day and don't think about, but get frustrated with or whatever. So I think I'm going to read just one of my poems um, that's my own here today. And it came from a prompt. Somebody told me that to write an ode and to look at Pablo Neruda's odes. So I'm going to read one of his odes later, but this was mine. And it, it's somewhat of a pandemic poem. It's called Ode to High Heels. It's dedicated to my only pair of black stilettos. <laughs> you thought we'd lost interest in you and your sisters. This year we sheltered in. Your allure had become a thing of the past. We sat in front of screens that never revealed our feet. My dear, I have never lost interest in the sleek curve of calf lifted to towering heights between heel and toes, the uplift of my soul. It's only that we parted ways years before when I made the decision to wear only pumps with modest heels that allowed me to run across airports to make a plane. But I made an exception once, for you stole my heart. And I had an occasion to ask you to be my date. I felt so tall, so elegant. I had to practice walking to cross the room. It's not about walking silly, my friend explained. So I stood and sat and draped one leg over the other. You dangled from my foot with acrobatic grace. Then you sat in the closet forlorn, waiting for another call that never came. As I aged, even the pumps shifted to the back rows of the shoe rack. Birkenstocks and ufus prevailed along with sneakers, finally replaced by the sheepskin slippers with stepped upon heels. You might have thought <clears throat> the fashion passed. Women were wiser about choosing comfort over style but then I saw the photos, streets of New York with women dressed for work again. High heels came roaring back. You are the life of the party, the picture of elegance, the promise of seduction. I'm glad I brought you to the thrift shop in the hope of a new life. <laughs> Thank you. So now I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Pilkington. Okay. Um, thanks, Meg and David, for having me. Um, I was um, just thinking about humor in, in, in poetry. Um, and um, I was thinking that, you know, I love the romantic poets and I, uh, I studied them, uh, uh, but they, they took uh, humor and sex out of poetry. So you have to go back before 1798 to find it again. You'll find it in, in you know, uh, A Pope's Rape of the Lock, the satire it found in that, or Chaucer's the Canterbury Tales of Street People in that poem. Uh, I think Philip, Philip Larkin brought, brought it back in the early 60s and read some of his work, the English poet Philip Larkin, who's a wonderful poet. Um, and, and for me, um, humor, you know, I'm not a comedian. I don't, I don't go to poetry to hear you know, jokes. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to a, a, a comedy store, but I love when I do uh, hear um, subtle twists and turns in language um, and, and, and the poetry and, and the humor that is in, in the poem that you find. It's not necessarily laugh out loud humor, uh, uh, but, but it's there and it makes you smile internally. 
Um, and I was thinking about, I was gonna, I'm just gonna read two relatively short poems today. Um, and a, a good source of humor in poetry are kids. Uh, my, my niece, when she's around four years old, um, you know, the world was new, the language is even newer. So we'd have these wonderful conversations, you know, and, and, and she put these wonderful turns on, on phrases, uh, common phrases that we all know in certain words. Um, uh, so for instance, one time she saw me smoking a cigar and she came out and she said, Kevin, don't you realize that if you smoke, you're gonna go to Kansas? <laughs> <laughs> so that scared the hell out of me. And, uh, so um, what I did was I just basically jotted down all the phrases over a couple of months that, that I love that, you know, during our conversations. So uh, this particular poem comes out of those, one of those discussions, it's called Apple Spider. My niece at age four is already tired of the language as we know it. Instead of orange juice, she asked for a glass of apple spider. And at lunch at a diner in town, she wanted me to place a quarter in a little juice box <laughs> next to the table and play a song. When we got home, I walked up into her bedroom in search of some sort of proof that she is what I always expected, a genius. Perhaps there would be books on linguistics, philosophy, philosophy, Shakespeare or essays by Pound who might have ignited her passion to make it new. But there was nothing by Plato under her purple hippo, no critical works amongst her coloring books or Socrates hidden behind her dolls. Later, when her mother claimed her daughter can't even read and the classics for a four-year-old are Barney and Lambtrop, I still wasn't convinced. So when my niece told me she heard I liked poet trees, then asked, where do they grow? We both picked up our cold glasses of root beard, held on to each other's hand, then headed out the door to see if any were growing in the backyard. You know, I found out after I, that came out and it was in a book about 15 years ago. And uh, I, I got, after it was out for a month or so, I got a letter from Harvard Medical School. And uh, apparently, at, at, I don't know if they still do, but then they would, they would read a poem at, at, at the commencement, medical commencement, medical school commencement. And uh, they, they sent me this letter thanking me. That's, that's the poem they read and how much they enjoyed it. And I, I thought that was great. And I thought, gee, the check must be in my envelope. You know? <laughs> so, so I looked in the envelope, it wasn't there. Well, it probably fell on the floor and I looked around. So it wasn't on the floor either. So it was just a thank you. Uh, so they thankful. sent the check to your niece. Yeah, I, she didn't get one either. But I would have split it, you know, 60-40. Um, I have one other poem I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read. Um, and uh, I was pleased with the way this poem turned out. Um, there's also a, a turn in, in, in a lot of contemporary poetry. So in a sense, uh, the real subject comes later in the poem, and the poem turns uh, towards the subject. And uh, I had read a, a, an essay by T.S. Eliot who said, uh, love poems are strange things. You know, you write it to one person, but it's meant to be heard by many. So I thought, okay, I'm, I'm gonna write a love poem. And uh, so uh, I finally got to the love poem a, uh, aspect in the poem, the element of the poem. Um, so I was, I was pleased with the poem itself, but then I realized I wasn't reading and I couldn't quite understand why I wasn't reading. And I realized it's probably the title. And the title is, a heartfelt thank you to all the women who dumped me. Okay. I, want to, I want to thank them all for finding fault with me, pointing out my imperfections, then ending it in person, by phone or even by email. To Claudia, who 15 years ago learned in time to despise me for snoring and sleeping with the window open, even in winter. And Margot, who was quite tall, and during the first few months said I was the perfect height for her but discovered my salary was way too small. Then there was Kate, who was in love with David Bowie, and even though she tried, could only love me. So thanks to each and every one for making sure I wasn't worth it. If things had worked out with any of them, I would never have met you. Our anniversary is coming soon. Even though she says she wants nothing since what we have between us is gift enough, I plan to go to the shore at midnight. Remove as many stars as I can hold before rearranging the rest so no one will know that they are gone. 
Then I'll place a dozen or more stars attached to long stems of sky in the glass vase, shaped like hands at the center of our table, filled with a glittering bouquet of twilight. Mm. That's it. So, um, I guess there's humor there, you know, uh, I hope there is. Um, and there's all kinds of humor in poetry. There's, uh, you know, satire, there's irony. Uh, uh, David mentioned Dada, the surrealism, those are all forms of, of humor. Um, and um, I think poets realize that humor uh, is, a, is a necessary emotion, it's valid. Uh, Again, after the Romantics and even modern poetry, it was you know light you know humorous poetry was relegated to light humor, um, and then I think when uh, Philip Larkin and other poets realized, hey, you know, why not laugh? For me, humor uh, gets me through, through the dark uh, elements in a poem. It's a way out in, into something more positive. So I, I use it that way myself, and it might be just a line or a phrase uh, that'll jolt you hopefully or make you smile a little bit. But not necessarily laugh out loud. Anyway, that, I like uh, that. Uh, so anyway, that's that's my take on it. I I love that in your poetry, Kevin, and and it does. I mean, I love dark humor anyway, but it gave us an opportunity to, or you, an opportunity to say this really heartfelt thing, without it being overly sentimental in a sense, I guess. They, yeah, just, I mean, um, who was it? Said, uh, Oscar Wilde said even sentimental, sentimentality is written with, with, you know, real honesty and, and feeling. But uh, you have to be careful with that. You know, uh, you don't want to overwhelm your poem. So, be, so uh -huh. then, then the poem becomes lost. So you try to keep it at bay somewhat you know, or, or balanced. Uh, but um, yeah, I just think, I just think, uh, you know, and we obviously, uh, Billy Collins is a big proponent of humor. That's how he made his fortune. If there is a fortune in poetry. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think so, but he's one of the few who, who probably can't make a living on it. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, he really, but his poems, I think his poems are, are quite serious also. There's serious elements in his work. That, uh, and, and, and people go to his work now expecting to laugh and they miss you know, the heart in the in his work, you know, and and, and, uh, and the real feeling that's there as well underneath the humor. Um, so again, you don't, you don't want your humor to overwhelm your poem, you know, if that's uh, hopefully not. So that's, that's, that's how I feel about it. That's great. So that's a great segue into the second half of our program where we'll be reading some poems by other poets, David and I, and then we'll go into this larger conversation about poetry and humor and favorite poets. So, um, David, I'm going to ask you to get us started and read just one or two poems, and then I'll read a poem or two, and we'll go a couple times around and then, then have our conversation. So... So you're up first, David. Uh, you might. I even wrote down "muted" and put it in front of my computer. <laughs> um, oh wait, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, all right, I'm going to write uh, read uh, a W. S. Merwin translation. Um, I, I got to see him read uh, back in 1981, I guess. And uh, it, was, it was a great reading. And I think this is one of the first ones he read. Uh, this is a translation by, uh, uh, by Merwin of Roberto Juaro's Spanish poet. Um, so I'm awake. I'm asleep. I'm dreaming that I'm awake. I'm dreaming that I'm asleep. I'm dreaming that I'm dreaming. I'm dreaming that I'm dreaming that I'm awake. I'm dreaming that I'm dreaming that I'm asleep. 
I'm dreaming that I'm dreaming that I'm dreaming. I'm awake. That cracked me up back in 1981. I mean, I love it. It's just, there's surprise, there's shock. And uh, the other one I want to read, it's, I, I'm glad it, Kevin it was talked about the it. name of that poet again. Uh, Roberto, it's, 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 I don't know how, Horroz, it's J-U-A-R-R-O-Z. I'll, uh, I'll type it in the, in the chat later. Um, this is a great book. He, it's it's uh, two books. I don't know if it's still in print, but uh, his translations are, are very amazing from many languages. Um, and then uh, it's, it's fun, Kevin, picked his niece who was four um, because one of the ones I picked to read was um, by a fourth grade student, this, this kind of cool little book, anthology of like grade school and high school kids. And uh, this is from Malachi J, <laughs> just the initial J, Malachi J, uh, fourth grade from Boone Elementary School. My sister ate my homework. My sister ate my homework. It's actually kind of a funny feeling. It makes my toes tingle to where my feet begin to dance because my sister ate my homework. How could that be? The dog and I worked on it endless hours. He helped me with my multiplication and especially with the division. Oh my. That's a whole other story. He's quite a tutor, or should I say, tutor. <laughs> anyway, maybe that's why she got so jealous, because he's so much help and smells a lot better. I left my homework on my desk. I swear, I looked for it everywhere, even at the dog, who was definitely innocent. I swear. I turned to look at my sister, and I saw it with my own eyes. She swallowed it whole, all my hard work gone in one bite. <laughs> I'm amazed, fourth grade. That's great. Brilliant. So back to you, Meg. All right, thank you, Dave. <laughs> I think I'm gonna start with the poet that <clears throat> Kevin introduced me to when we were first talking about this program. And he said, well, check out the poems of so-and-so and so-and-so. And, so and, so. and so I did, and these weren't poets I know. And um, this poem is by George Bilger. And George Bilger is a poet from Cleveland, Ohio, who teaches at John Carroll University. And Billy Collins said about him that George Bilger is a smooth talking poet whose ease of language can lead us unawares into the a complex terrain of the heart and spirit. I thought that was really nice. And then I discovered that he also hosts a radio program on WJCU in, out of Cleveland called Wordplay, which was the name we had uh, given to this program unknown that, that he all already had taken that name. <laughs> So this poem, also in honor of St. Patrick's Day that's coming up, is called Corn, Beef, and Cabbage. I can see her in the kitchen, cooking up for the hundredth time, a little something from her limited Midwestern repertoire. Cigarette going in the ashtray, the red wine pulsing in its glass a warning light, meaning everything was simmering just below the steel lid of her smile as she boiled the beef into submission, chopped her way through the vegetable kingdom with the broken handled knife I used tonight. Feeling her anger rising from the dark chambers of the head of cabbage I sliced through, missing her, wanting to chew things over with my mother again. 
that just reminded me of my mother, <laughs> who was also a terrible cook. <laughs> you know? um, and the second one I'm going to read, I, I had picked out all male poets and I thought, well, women poets must have a sense of humor too. So I ended up Googling and looking for women poets, humorous poets. And I came across Wendy Cope, who uh, was raised in Kent, England. And her first book of poetry is called Making Coco for Kinsley Amos. And it was an incredible success selling tens of thousands of copies in the UK. She currently uh, lives in Winchester, England, and she's published numerous collections of poetry and a prose collection and several children's books. But I didn't know her work and I found this poem that I enjoyed. So it's called Differences of Opinion by Wendy Cope. One, he tells her. He tells her that the earth is flat. He knows the facts, and that is that. In altercations fierce and long, she tries her best to prove him wrong. But he has learned to argue well. He calls her arguments unsound and often asks her not to yell. She cannot win. He stands his ground. The planet goes on being round. Two, your mother knows. Your mother knows the earth's a plane and challenged sheds a martyr's tear. God give her strength to bear this pain, a child who says the world's a sphere. Challenge she sheds a martyr's tear. It's bad to make your mother cry. By telling her the world's a sphere, it's very bad to tell a lie. It's bad to make your mother cry. It's bad to think your mother odd. It's very bad to tell a lie. All this has been ordained by God. It's bad to think your mother odd. The world is round, that's also true. All this has been ordained by God. It's hard to see what you can do. The world is round, that must be true. She's praying, hoping you will change. It's hard to see what you can do. Already people find you strange. She's praying, hoping you will change. You're difficult, you don't fit in. Already people find you strange. You know your anger is a sin. You're difficult, you don't fit in. God give her strength to bear this pain. You know your anger is a sin. Your mother knows the earth's a plane. I love that. I think that form is a pantoum where the, the lines get repeated uh, in the next stanza in a different order. And she did a delightful job with that pantoum. And I, I'm not usually one that goes for rhyming poetry. And I just love that particular poem. So that was Wendy Cope. Um, uh, David, to you. And we might make this our last round so we have some time for discussion. Um, I love pantoons. I, I, uh, can you hear me? Because I muted before. Yeah. Yes. I, I love pantoons. Uh, <clears throat> this poet Jane Shore taught a workshop one time I went to and wrote one with uh, Chinese fortune cookie things she saved. So that's a fun thing to do. I, I so that for the next 20 Chinese meals I ate over the next six months or whatever, I saved all the fortune cookies things and just laid them out. And, and they really make amazing pantoums. <laughs> Great. Non sequitur, but they make total oh, sense. Oh, that's a great time. prompt for our audience. Yeah, it, it really works. It's it's brilliant. Um, um, all right, I'm going to read one. It's really famous, but the first time I ever heard it, I really 
really loved it uh, by William Carlos Williams. <laughs> and uh, you can just kind of imagine getting home from a vacation maybe or, or waking up in the morning and seeing a note on your fridge. But this is just to say, I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were delicious, so sweet and so cold. <laughs> what a cold note. <laughs> I love that poem. Merciless. Um, now I'm gonna cheat really and read one of my own because I have to get it off my chest and right. self-promotion. I got um, Love really, it. It's just, it's just in my head rattling around. Uh, it's called Neurotica. I can't think, but all I do is think. I think all the time. I don't know what I think about. I think about all sorts of things. I try to think of ways to be free. I try to think of ways to be happy. I try to think of things to do. I try to think of things to say. I try to make decisions. I try to decide what I want and what I don't want to do. I try to decide whether or not what I want is really what I want. Sometimes I think what I really want is something I haven't thought of yet. Sometimes I want two completely different things at the exact same time. Sometimes I can't decide. I can't decide. I want to quit thinking about it all the time. I want to quit thinking about it all the time. But I keep thinking about it because it would be nice to know because then I could maybe make progress one way or another, but I don't know. I'm not so sure. I have to think about it. I'm doing a lot of that. That was great, David. Thank you. So, um, I can read one more by somebody else I found, if you want, or you can take it over. Why don't you read one and then I'll read the last one. I'll get the last word in. This was, this was fun because I found it just because of the assignment. So I went on the Poetry Foundation site and, you know, funny poems. And those aren't easy. Well, before you do search. that, huh? David, David, can I interrupt just before you do that? There's somebody who posted in the chat a link to different riffs on that Williams <laughs> poem that you've. I, I can't wait to read it, but I just oh, yeah. wanted to point that, that out. That sounds great. Yeah, that's Go a ahead. famous one. I bet those are great. So yeah, it's it's a rough uh, Google prompt or, or whatever, funny poems, uh, but I found this one I really like. Uh, it's called Must Work by Steve Downs, D-O-W-N-E-S. Must write, must write, must work, must work. Minimum wage or better. Can't be too physical, got a bad back. Can't be too stressful, bend under pressure. Can't be too sexual, haven't got the legs. Must write, must write, must work, must work. Minimum wage or better. Can't work for corporate, I'm an anarchist. Can't work for church, I'm a heathen. Can't work for commune, I'm a free spirit. Can't work for capitalist, I'm a lazy sod. Must write, must write, must work, must work. Minimum wage or better. Please give job. I'll do anything except list above. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank That's you, my job David. resume too. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you read that one. Like must, work, uh, must work, <laughs> must work. Must write, must write, must work, must work. All right. My last poem uh, that I'll read is a poem by a poet named Rob Carney, who's a poet and nonfiction writer. His latest book of poems called Call and Response uh, was published by Black Lawrence Press, who also publishes uh, several of Kevin's collections of poetry. And this poem is called When the Mermaids Filed a Class Action Lawsuit. <laughs> Right on. It, it's maybe even a bridge into our next eco poetry event. So, some thought they didn't have standing. 
Another thought, maybe they did, but only on a boat, you know, because of maritime law. She said, that means all we have to do is bore a few holes in the ones at the marina. I know sinking boats sounds expensive, but believe me, not compared to punitive damages. She meant owing for the decades and miles of lost nets, adrift now and noosing through the water. She meant for oil spills and barges of garbage a century deep. She meant for kelp beds the size of the Amazon gone and everything coastal with them. From rockfish and otters and abalone to the ocean's biggest carbon sink to mermaids complaining that our plastic is worse than disease. There was a pause. Waves sloshed against the pilings. Then somebody spoke. On the other hand, he reminded them, mermaid, mermaids are not even people. So the judge will throw this out and we're off the hook. And it sounded like wisdom and everyone cheered. Mermaids are people. <laughs> so, that's great. Uh, Lucas, if you can put Kevin in the spotlight too, we'll have a little bit of a, a conversation uh, here and we'll take questions from the chat as well. Um, but I just start, there were so many poets that I didn't get to read. I didn't read the ode, any of Pablo Neruda's odes, but there was an ode to my socks that I really loved that I'll put in our follow-up. And there are Billy Collins poems that I love. But how about the two of you? What, who were some of the poets that we didn't read that you find funny and, or humorous in some way and really appreciate for that aspect of them? You know, that, that's, a, um, that's a difficult um, uh, question to answer because there are so many poets who have uh, uh, humorous and comical elements to their work, but not necessarily through the entire poem or the entire yep. book. Um, so, I mean, there are poets, poets that I will read, oh, and I'll go, wow, that's really funny, that's really witty, that's really humorous. But not, I don't consider them necessarily a, 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 a you know, in, in quotes, comedic poem, a poet, the way I say Collins is or Laguerre. Uh, Bill, Bill Laguerre is a wonderful poet that you, that you read. Um, and uh, I often think he's a, He's up, he's up there with Collins in many ways and maybe surpasses him in many ways. Um, and, um, but, but again, there's, there's so many, you know, so many poets who have, you know, twists twist on, on phrases and uh, uh, an outlook on life uh, that might even be just like in a, in a stanza, and the rest of the poem isn't, it's, it's not so humorous. Um, so uh, I think it's kind of wide open. Um, and, and, and I, and I think it sometimes it even does a disservice uh, to poets who, oh, you know, uh, let's go to a Billy Collins uh, uh, reading and laugh, you know, because you miss out on all the other stuff he's working in his poems. Uh, he's, he's working on human emotion and connection and, 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 and real emotional feelings uh, uh, with his, especially with his reader. And he'll write about, he writes about which I, I try to do in my own work, I write about what everyone else overlooks, all right? Um, and he, as he writes about little things, like looking at his cat, you know? Uh, uh, or um, the, the person who is, uh, who, who uh, panhandles on the corner and then he worries because she's not there on, on, on Friday, you know? Things like that, you know, uh, that are humorous, but then there's this real human caring element to his work that I think sometimes is overlooked. So I think you have to be careful with that. And again, I think humor is, is a way out of the darkness and, and towards some type of healing, um, uh, as all poetry is, in, in my estimation. It, it is a way of healing. Uh, you know, a wound is where, I think, uh, uh, a, a wound is where the light of poetry enters and heals, you know? Um, and, and, and real poets know that and recognize that. And, and so in any given poem, you, you, you could have... Uh, Someone was really upset and, 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 and uh, 
and, and, uh, and down and, and um, some, some experience in their life isn't go, going well, and then they'll, they'll turn it around in, in the next stanza, you know, that'll make you smile, you know? So it hits all the emotions. And I yeah. think that's the richer poem, you know? And someone mentioned also in, in the chat about a rhyme. You know, I've had this discussion with, with many classes that, that, that poems always, they still rhyme, the good poems rhyme. They don't hang out at the end of the line all the time where, you know, that's, that's where people's comfort zone is, who don't read that much poetry. But rhyme moves inside. Even the poems you read, Meg and, and, and uh, David, there's rhyme throughout those poems, but not necessarily at the end of the line. Um, I just want to sort of jump in and say that. I get, that's something that's I would, great. I would like to address that. David, do you have some other favorite poets that you feel their humor is something you appreciate? Yes, absolutely. Um, like what Kevin said about sometimes the darkness brings the light. Like uh, I saw a musician one time called Diamanda Gallus. Um, I had just never seen anything like that. And it, she sang a set of blues songs it was at a grand piano with just a spotlight coming down. And uh, she has a vocal range of three octaves and she sat at this piano and just started playing. I, I had just never seen anything like it. It was so dark that it gave me an epiphany. Like it just blew me into the light. Like it, it was, it was amazing. That was the first experience that I had. And, and then like, like I said, when you first said, go look for funny poems, and I, I thought of daddy, it's just like, because that line, you know, the phone is off at the root, the words just can't worm through. Like a lot, I mean, just, you know, on and on, phrases like that, they're just so beautiful. Like I, I don't call them funny, but they open up my heart in the same way somehow. Or like I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the shores of silent seas. Like it's not a knee slapper, but wow, you know, <laughs> it it hits me where I live. Um, and like John John Berryman, the dream songs, very subtle stuff. Some of it I really don't get, and some of it I do. But it's like life, friends, is boring. We must not say so. You know, I I love that opening line and this is a, a James Tate book City of the White Donkeys that's it's got a lot of really great humor um and then in terms actually, of the actually play, I don't mean to interrupt but James Tate is, is really a, a very a very yeah, funny James, poet yeah yeah he's great I, I guess. Uh, there was a, a group of poets that came out of the 60s the surrealist new surrealist poets James Tate was one of them. Charles Simic, who's still writing in, in Marvelous. We oh, Charles yeah, Simic, yeah. you know, uh, uh, Tom Lux for a bit was it, and, and they were just, uh, you know, they worked with, with surrealism, and you'll find a lot of humor in their work, as you do it on most of surrealism, because it takes reality and sort of spins it on its on its head in a sense. Um, um, and then anyway, so I just want to jump in on that. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, David. It's all right. I'm glad you did. Now I can look up new surrealist poets. <laughs> But uh, like wordplay, like, you know, these, these two books, I just happened to find them. Like they came out when I was in grade school, but you know, he's hilarious the way he, he just twists words and misspells, and just bends language all around. Like one of them, like there once was a man named Partly Dave. <laughs> that was my favorite because I was Partly Dave. That was like from grade school. And then there's this guy, a uh, Russian writer, actually, Daniel Carms. Today I wrote nothing. <laughs> that, that photo says everything about that. <laughs> but I love his quote um, that uh, he wrote in his diaries. Uh, let's see. Life interests me only in its most absurd manifestations. Um, I am interested only in nonsense, only in that which has no practical meaning. Life interests me only in its most absurd manifestations. And I feel like that sometimes when I'm trying to write, it's like, I can't make sense because all I got is nonsense. Like the only sense that makes sense is nonsense. There's nothing else makes sense. And then my last show and tell item is 
this book I just stumbled across, it's just absolutely brilliant. Um, Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows. Um, I'll just read a quick one. It's, he mashed up the word aesthetic and uh, like prosthetic device, you know, and uh, it's asthosis, A-E-S-T-H-O-S-I-S. The state of feeling trapped inside your own subjective tastes, not knowing why you find certain things beautiful or ugly, only that you do, wishing you could remove the socio-psychological lenses from your eyes so you could see the beauty in anything and be moved to tears by the smell of burning garbage, the aria of a screaming toddler or a neon Elvis painted on black velvet. I think everybody finds neon Elvis is on black velvet beautiful. So I don't know about that, but, but this was just a surprise book. Uh, I don't know even where, but it's, I'm recommending it. It's, it's hilarious. It's since the devil's dictionary, it's the best like wordplay dictionary. I think. Well, that's great. And I, I love what you're both saying about absurdity and, um, that I was listening to that wordplay um, broadcast or one of them, just a bit of it from George Bilger. And what he was saying was so funny. And it was just the things we take for granted that we do. And why do we do that? And so he was ripping off some Walt Whitman about walking naked. And he had said he'd walked naked in the park. And then he started ripping off, well, why do we wear clothes at all? And isn't this kind of silly? And we wear different clothes to bed than, than we wear during the day. And, you know, that, I it's actually exactly 14 degrees outside of New York. And I'm going out later and I'm going to wear my clothes. <laughs> So just, just so you know. Okay. That's that's why we wear them, right? Yeah, that's a good reason. Yeah, that's a good reason. And there is no bad weather. There's <laughs> only bad clothing, right? That's <laughs> I don't know. I'd, I'd wear bad, bad clothing in this weather, uh, you know, so. Spoken so like I'd love it if the audience <laughs> put their any favorite poems or poets in the chat that they find a sense of humor in. And um, if there are questions that people have or comments that they'd like to make, if they put them in the chat, I'd be happy to share them or, or call on you. Um, but that's, uh, I don't know. I, I find the everyday element. So Lucas just put Shel Silverstein in the chat. And, and, you know, when we were talking about this, I, um, Kevin, you said, well, you know, humor had been relegated for a long time to light verse and, and, and not serious poetry where it, it has come back today and is acceptable, but there's so much light verse that's so enjoyable too. I mean, I love Ogden Nash. Oh, his famous poem that I always loved. And actually I, I kind of, say to myself all the time when I when I drive up to Sarah Lawrence where I teach I, I, I have to go through the Bronx and um, Alden Nash wrote uh, a one-line poem and the title is The Bronx and it goes The Bronx no thonks <laughs> so if anybody's from the Bronx I don't mean to uh, offend you in any way but I always find that hilarious you know <laughs> funny one-line poem so, but yeah, I mean, basically he was, you know, and a lot of the stuff he does is really sort of uh, unique and interesting and funny, you know? So, uh, but it was relegated to his inferior poetry, which is ridiculous, all right? Um, who's to say what's inferior or, inferior or not in poetry? Uh, um, but uh, there, it, you're right, there is a lot of light, considered light poetry that's is very funny and, and effective, you know? And we grew up reading Shel Silverstein that Lucas put in the chat to our kids. I remember my brother reading it to his kids. And then when his son was going to have a baby, he wrapped up a copy of a Shel Silverstein book and gave it to his father as a way of telling him that he was going to have his first grandchild. Oh, nice. And, and, Lucas put in the chat that he says he finds some of his poems to have that surreal analysis and humor 
in the reality of things. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, there is a lot of, there are touches of surrealism in a lot of contemporary poetry. Um, uh, and like this, the, the surrealists themselves, you know, the, the French surrealists, you don't snap reality the way that that surrealism does, but more contemporary surrealist touches sort of bend reality and add a dimension that perhaps you can't capture in a painting or a photograph, uh, which I always find intriguing and really engrossing, you know, so. And I think uh, Sharoni from Toronto put Dennis Lee up here in Canada, alligator pie, et cetera. Do either of you know Dennis Lee? Dennis, no, I do not. I did notice there's one down here, Bill Knott, um, who is a who is a really a wonderful poet, um, and uh, he he used to sign sign when in his in his thirties when he was writing he'd say Bill Knott you know it, 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 he'd give his dates nineteen forty to like nineteen fifty eight like he'd give for some reason you know he was dead all right uh, but he he was quite humorous and um, he would. Um, he would he would put together chapbooks, uh, put uh, put them together, you know, just cheaply made cheaply made, you know, staple them, and on the back of the chapbooks, he'd put comments for all the art, all the critics who hated his work, <laughs> and he and he would send them around. I got about three of them here, and he would send them to friends. He would send them around, and I just thought it was the funniest thing, uh, you know, and, and you know, uh, and here's a guy with all kinds of awards and books, etc. Actually, Thomas Lux. Um, a dear friend of mine who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, uh, who actually brought me to Sarah Lawrence, was was very a uh, very dear friend of uh, Bill Knott, and he he put together right before Tom died, he put together um, a book of uh, uh, Bill Knott's poetry. So if you're interested in really sort of engaging, strange, interesting, fun uh, poetry, check out that book. Uh, it's uh, Bill Knott's, I think it's his collected work, and it, the editor is Tom Lux. Came out five Thank years you. right before Tom died. So. Thank anyway. you. And someone else put uh, Chris Shabo, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, wrote Simon Armitage. Armitage, thank you for waiting. And if you put people put limericks or references to limericks here, but we said no limericks in this. <laughs> and I, you know, one of the reasons we we did that not, is is that a lot of people go to limericks and light verse when they think of humor and poetry. And what we wanted to bring out is that there's so much more to, to humor as it's used in poetry, that there's there's wit and there's wordplay and there's surrealism and there's, you know, the unexpected and so many other things that work into that in, in very serious forms of poetry. Some of the funniest poems I've heard are just by friends of mine, like not published, you know, not, not big deal poets at all, but like, um, you know, you go to open mics or, or readings and um, I mean, sometimes there'll be somebody that just, just knocks your socks off or just cracks you up and just out of nowhere. Uh, so, and then generally I don't find haikus funny, but there, somebody got this book, Her Cold Martini. This, this is the best haiku book ever <laughs> I mean, read one got one yeah yeah like wearing his life jacket the little boy runs through the sprinkler and uh atlanta flight delay low visibility in the smoking lounge <laughs> <laughs> i remember those smoking lounges you know they're just glass boxes people had to go to <laughs> yeah, if you weren't going to die from smoking, you were going to die from going in the smoking lounge. I don't think they even have those anymore. But uh, yeah, 
Somebody else mentioned E. Cummings, and I, in one of the invitations to this event, I um, put an E. E. Cummings quote that was a damn everything but the circus. And it's That's a, a great quote, quote I love that just is about embracing life. And I, I do love the E. E. Cummings, and my mother did too. So that particular poem was one of her favorites. One of them I picked for today was an E.E. E. Cummings poem about um, Buffalo Bill, but that one, really, really short one. Um, it's not really funny, but it's just, again, the language is just so beautiful and fast. And uh, um, Well, it's really short, so I mean, I've got, I, I'm gonna, you can get the cane and get me off stage if you want, but it, it's Buffalo Bill. Buffalo Bill's defunct, who used to ride a water smooth silver stallion and break one, two, three, four, five pigeons just like that. Jesus, he was a handsome man. And what I want to know is how do you like your blue eyed boy, Mr. Death? See, not a knee slapper, but the shock. I, I, I might be alone in, in that sort of sensibility, but I don't think I'm alone in it, but it's not, it's not the mainstream of, of I don't know. The, the name of the haiku book is that her cold martini? Yes. Is that the um, name? Yeah, where did I go? Yeah, by uh, Marsh Muirhead. Great. Somebody was asking about that. Thank you. Yes, I think surprise, and Ellen Goldsmith is saying surprise is great in poems in general and certainly contributes to the humor. Yeah, it's, it's like humor is pretty personal. Like I, I have had friends with entirely different senses of humor than me, and it can be awkward. <laughs> you know, it's like... Well, I think you said to me, David, that you your poems people were saying were very dark poems until you read them or performed them and then everybody was laughing. So is it, 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 is it so different to read a poem out loud than to read it on the page? I think it can be. I mean, definitely the first two or three years I wrote, I'd show people my poems and they'd go, God, that's depressing, you know? <laughs> and then the first reading I did, I, you know, just made up funny voices because I mean I didn't mean them to be depressing and and people were cracking up and it's like oh wow and then some I write that I don't even mean to be funny people laugh at and and others I think you know this is funny and people are just oh god and the first times I was reading and doing readings you know people would laugh and they'd say oh you should go to the comedy club and you know go try that out I went to the comedy club and they'd go, oh, you should go to the poetry readings. <laughs> because uh, it's so different when the audience is sitting there, make me laugh, you know, to like people are just showing up to hear some poetry and yeah, they, they will respond to just something, a surprise of language or a different perspective. Whereas in the comedy clubs, well, it just brings out a really different audience and they're there to laugh and they want to be more uh, shocked or that's why I like subtle comics like Stephen Wright, you know, uh, that they don't rely on just horrendous language or just horrible images, you know, they just rely on subtle tricks of, of using language and thought and insight, you know, I don't think a humorous poem and a good comic, I think, are the same for me. Yeah, and I think it's hard to be funny on purpose. So I admire comics that can be funny and that strike my funny bone because so many of them don't. But yeah, so I, I think we should probably wrap up here and um, wonder if any of you want to make a last comment or a last laugh. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. Do we get a copy of the chat somewhere? Because I've 
definitely not kept up with that. Yes, I will save the chat, make sure we've saved the chat. And so we'll get you a copy of the chat and we'll give a, a follow up with the poems that we read um, from other poems or other things that people put in the chat as recommendations. Not the movies, I hope that was fun. Um, just I watched those kind of flying past, but it, it's always helpful to remember what makes us laugh and what makes us smile in the course of the day. And that's so important. Absolutely. So please come back again and join us on April 10th for Eco Poetry Voices of Our Future. And on April 20th for Naomi Shihab Nye. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye everybody. Thank you, Kevin. Good seeing you. Take care. Good seeing all y'all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Kevin. Bye. Thanks, David. Yeah. You guys were great today. It's so much fun to to do this with you and and just fun to have this assignment of looking yeah, I really I needed that yeah. assignment this month yeah that's great thank you for that great thank you Bye. great take care Bye. stay warm wear clothes yeah keep it yeah, keep it yeah keep them on <laughs> bye <laughs>